Welcome back to part two on our documentary on Joseph Carey Merrick, The Elephant Man. We've seen all the horrors of what happened and read about or heard about all the horrors of ha what happened to Joseph in Europe. He arrived back at Liverpool Street Station on the 24th of June 1886, safely back in his own country, but with nowhere to go. But what would Joseph do now he was back in London? He was not eligible to enter a workhouse in London for more than one night and would be accepted only by Leicester Union where he had become a permanent resident beforehand and where he was born. Leicester was 98 miles away. He approached strangers for help but his speech was so unintelligible and his appearance, his appearance sorry for this word, so repugnant. He drew a crowd of curious onlookers who chased him down, as we've seen in the little clip, which is not nice at all. The policeman helped him into an empty waiting room where he huddled in a corner, exhausted, unable to make himself understood. His only identifying possession was Frederick Treves' card, which we've already seen. He handed the card to the police. The police contacted Treves. He went to the station, recognising Joseph Merrick straight away. Treves took him in a handsome cab to the London hospital, and Merrick was admitted for bronchitis, washed, fed, and then put to bed in a small isolation room in the hospital's attic, which we've already seen from my little location filming. Here we see how Joseph had travelled around to try and draw as least attention to himself as possible. This cap with bag affair is an actual, though this is from the film, this is a pure representation of exactly how he went about in the street just to try and avoid too much attention. Um, with Joseph admitted into the hospital, Treves now had time to conduct a more thorough examination he discovered that Merrick's physical condition had deteriorated over the previous two years and that he had become quite impaired by his deformities. Treves also suspected that Merrick now had a heart condition and had only a few years left to live. Merrick's general health improved over the next five months under the care of the hospital staff. Although some nurses were initially upset by his appearance, they overcome this and cared for him. The problem of his unpleasant odour was mitigated through frequent bathing and Treves gradually developed an understanding of Merrick's speech. A new set of photographs was taken, which we've already seen. The question of Merrick's long-term care had to be addressed. Francis Cargom, as we've already seen, addressed that problem with his letter to the Times and the subscriptions and everything that a lot of good people did to try and make Joseph's life good at the hospital. Um, a lot of people came to visit him. Some say that it was just the rich coming to see a freak and making themselves feel better about it. <clears throat> and some say that a lot of them came out of genuine kindness and compassion. So I'll leave that up to your imaginations. They left a lot of money for him and they often bought him presents and things. So yeah, his, his life in the hospital became a lot happier. And we're going to now see, see some of those scenes and uh, discuss a little bit more maybe first. Before we move on to those scenes, on the 21st of May 1887, two new buildings were completed at the Royal London Hospital and the Prince and Princess of Wales came to open them officially. Princess Alexandra wished to meet the Elephant Man so after a tour of the hospital, the royal party went to his rooms for an introduction. The princess shook Merrick's hand and sat with him, an experience that left him overjoyed. She gave him a signed photograph of herself, which became a prized possession, and she sent him a Christmas card each year. Now on to some of the scenes from the 1980 film of Joseph's time at the hospital. He is English. He is 21. His name is John Merrick. At no time have I met with such a perverted or degraded version of a human being as this man. Am I to assume then that he is ultimately incurable? 
Yes, sir. This hospital doesn't accept incurables. The freak hunting. Here we see Joseph in his rooms at the London Hospital with Dr. Treves, Francis Cargom, the director, and the matron. His life improved massively at the hospital and he made many friends, many society people came to see him. Some say that they came to view a freak in a friendly environment and some say that they came for kindness and charity and they certainly did give him a lot and made sure that he was looked after. Here we see him at his evening at the theatre that he absolutely loved, which was arranged for him. Joseph also discovered that he loved Christmas. He'd never had enjoyed one before or even been given presents. And we'll see one of the presents that he was given in a minute that he really loved. Here he's entertaining some people and they've bought him some nice gifts. And he also enjoyed showing his other gifts that he'd been given to his friends, his visitors and the nursing staff and people here that you can see. And Frederick Trees wrote that he was very childlike in his gratitude and his joy of things. And what you have to remember is he'd never experienced any of these kinds of things before ever. It was all new to Joseph. He loved photos and he was given many of them by his friends and admirers, some signed, and he enjoyed showing them to people and he enjoyed entertaining people as we're seeing here. And this was the present, a gentleman's dress box which he absolutely loved. Useless to someone with his medical conditions, but he enjoyed it and he could play the bow about town. And in his mind, he was very childlike. He could make believe very well. And yeah, it was one of his most treasured gifts. Be a true thing, he really did make that and was very talented in that regard. Very poetical and very creative. And here we see him. And there's the model again. We will see the real thing as we go on. Hope you've all enjoyed this little snippet. On three separate occasions, Joseph left the hospital and London and went on holiday, spending a few weeks at a time in the countryside through elaborate arrangements that allowed Merrick to board a train unseen and have an entire carriage to himself. He travelled to Northamptonshire to stay at Forsley Hall, the estate of Lady Knightley. He stayed at the gamekeeper's cottage and spent the days walking in the estate's woods collecting wild flowers. He befriended a young farm labourer who later recalled Merrick as an interesting and well-educated man. Treves called this the one supreme holiday of Merrick's life, although in fact there were three such trips. Yeah. Joseph's conditions gradually deteriorated during his four years at the London Hospital, who required a great deal of care from the nursing staff and spent much of his time in bed or sitting in his quarters with diminishing energy. His facial deformities continued to grow and his head became more enlarged. The only surviving letter written by Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man. This is his handwriting and this is the only uh, surviving letter of his, which is in a museum now. The model church constructed by Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, in the film <clears throat> which allows a little bit of artistic license. He's building a church that you can see over the top of the thing. But in actual reality, this is a replica of Maine's Cathedral. Joseph died on the 11th of April, 1890, at the age of 27, at around 3 p.m. Treves' house surgeon visited Merrick and found him lying dead across his bed. His body was formally identified by his uncle Charles Merrick. An inquest was held on the 27th of April by Wynne Edwin Baxter, who had come to notoriety conducting the inquests for the Whitechapel Jack the Ripper murders of 1888. Joseph's death was ruled as accidental 
and the certified cause of death was asphyxia, asphyxia, caused by the weight of his head as he lay down. Dr. Treves, who performed an autopsy, said Joseph had died of a dislocated neck, which likely severed his vertebral arteries. Knowing that Merrick had always slept, sitting in an upright position out of necessity, Trees concluded that Joseph must have made the experiment, attempting to sleep, lying down, like normal people. And that's the scene that we're going to see now, which is the end of Joseph's life. But it's not the end of the story, so we're going to see this scene. It's very sad, but there we are. Well, that was bloody sad, I know. Uh, that's what it is. Dr. Trees dissected Joseph's body and took plaster cast of his head and limbs. He took skin samples, which were later lost during the Second World War, and mounted his skeleton, which remains in the pathology collection of the Royal London Hospital, which amalgamated in 1995 with St Bartholomew's Hospital Medical College under the aegis of Queen Mary University of London. His mounted skeleton at the medical school is not on public display. For many, many years, people thought that Joseph received no form of burial whatsoever. There was a memorial service held for him, but more of that towards the end of the video. There is a small museum dedicated to his life, housing some of his personal effects, as we've seen the letter and the model of the church and a new replica of his skeleton went on display in 2012. His remains in a glass case are in a private room at the university, can be viewed by medical students and professionals by appointment only, to allow medical students to view and understand the physical deformities resulting from Joseph Merrick's condition. Although Queen Mary University London intends to keep his skeleton at its medical school, some are contending that, as a devout Christian, Joseph Merrick should have been given a Christian burial. And I said it wasn't the end of the story, and so it isn't. Amazingly enough, on the 5th of May 2019, while carrying out some other research work, author Joe Viger Mangovin discovered that Joseph's soft tissue had indeed been buried and was buried in the City of London Cemetery. We're looking at Joseph's burial entry, marked with a blue arrow here, of course. And what we're gonna see now is Joseph's last resting place, which is marked with a modern plaque. But it's nice to know that he isn't completely forgotten and that he does have a resting place. Although bearing in mind that cemeteries were often reused for new burials and things like that, bearing in mind his Victorian It'll probably be very deep down and the marker will mark probably the location of the grave but not the precise spot. Here's his page on findagrave.com. If you type in Joseph Carey Merrick, Elephant Man, Find a Grave, it will take you to his page on there with the plot number which is bed1771. And here is that, that bed, that Last resting place of Joseph Carey Merrick. And here's his memorial plaque. I will go and visit this sooner or later, pay my respects and uh, put some flowers down or something. And what we're going to examine now, because our story isn't quite finished, just some artifacts from Joseph's life before we end our story. Where it all began. Joseph's birth certificate on the 5th of August 1862 and he's born in Leicester. Father's name Joseph Rockley Merrick, mother's name Mary Jane and her maiden son name was Potterton and the father's occupation was a warehouseman. Joseph's family tree with Joseph right at the bottom right, uh, left sorry, bottom left in blue with his brother William and sister Marion. William died in infancy and Marion died young as well and it is believed that Marion also had deformities. 
so it does make you wonder if there was something genetically wrong coming from either of the parents which is more than likely and here we see that infamous cap and cloth bag covering for his face this is Joseph Merrick's actual hat and covering that he wore in real life and if he needed to travel around particularly before he was admitted to the hospital this is how he would do it to try and draw the least attention to himself it's an awful thing I will be going to this museum soon so watch this space so what was Joseph's medical condition what caused him to look like this it's still not properly known to this day for certain what was exactly wrong with Joseph it has been hypothesized that he may have suffered from a combination of papadermatocil and an unnamed bone deformity all cause nervous uh, all cause changes to the nervous system also given as a suggestion what he may have suffered from was neurofibromatosis other things have been hypothesized over the years such as Methusi syndrome and polystoptic fibrosis dysplasia the most recent conjecture or hypothesis for Joseph's medical condition is Proteus syndrome but as I say the skin t the skin samples were lost during the Second World War they do have his bones but don't forget to get the, that skeleton they'd have had to have removed every ounce of flesh and tissue from the bones most of which was buried um, the bones were bleached so scientists and people that deal in that kind of thing are even to this day trying to get DNA samples and a DNA profile of possibly exactly what was wrong with Joseph but those were the hypotheses of uh, what we've been suggested and as I say to this day it's still not known for certain exactly what he suffered from and there we have Joseph Carey Merrick and I began with the image and we're going to end with the image I spoke about that's what we're going to see now and as I say, I began with this image and I wanted to end with this image. You just saw the process of forensic anthropology and that forensic anthropologist or anthropologists worked very, very hard and removed all the bone growth and deformity from Joseph's image or Joseph's skull that they had to work with. And this is the, they rebuilt his face and this is the face that they rebuilt. This is Joseph Carey Merrick, the elephant man, but without the terrible deformities. And this is how I wanted to end our little series. I hope you've all found this interesting, ladies and gents, or informative at least. If you have, please give it a like and a share. Thanks very much for watching.